and welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today from Amsterdam is Nina Siegel, whose book is The Diary Keepers, World War II in the Netherlands as written by the people who lived through it. Nina, thank you so much for, um, for coming on the show today. I, I was really interested in talking to you about the book um, because one of the things that I, I happened upon in the last few years is the mass observation movement in England, the people who, uh, two sociologists started this with people keeping diaries and uh, sending them in. And, and it's just such a wonderful way of approaching history. So tell me what, tell us, um, what, what um, motivated you? What was, where was the germ of this idea? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, what was the germ of the idea? So I was introduced to this diary collection at the NIAD, which is an institute for war, Holocaust, and genocide studies in Amsterdam, um, in the course of doing some other reporting in relation to World War II. I work from here as a New York Times reporter. And I had been talking to a couple of researchers at the institute, and one of them said to me, after an interview, um, do you have just another minute? I want to show you something. And he took me downstairs into the archive, which is behind this massive bank vault door. And um, it looks, and then we went downstairs into what looks like a scientific laboratory, just all white. And, and then there were like these walls that they could crank open. And inside were files and files and files on this one wall. And he said, These, this whole wall is full of diaries and letters that were collected during the wartime period. And right afterwards, because we opened this institute just three, di three days after liberation, and um, the institute set about collecting all these diaries um, from people from all walks of life. So it wasn't um, testimonies of witnesses only. It was also like farmhands and people um, who were housewives and teachers and, and people who worked in all different parts of the economy, but also across a political spectrum. So not only did they collect diaries of um, Jewish people who had been victimized by the persecution, but also they went and re requested diaries from collaborators who had been either um, like uh, tried for their collaboration or who had in some lesser way been involved in um, in, the, in the occupation and supporting the Nazis. So they managed to collect a wide range of perspectives on the war. And for me, that was an invitation to, to dig into it. Um, also because they had just begun to transcribe them. So a lot of these diaries had been illegible or inaccessible for years because they had been, um, like either copied um, back in, like they had taken a, taken the diary, copied it and sent the original back. So they were very hard to read the copies sometimes mimeographed or made into microfiche, which is like on these tiny little letters. Some of them, <laughs> um, some of them were like on black paper with white writing and it was all handwritten in Dutch. So it was very inaccessible, but now they had started this process of transcribing it with a group of volunteers who were turning it into digital files and which made it easier. So my initial thought was, I'm going to work with the ones that have already been transcribed <laughs> and see what I can find out about this period. Um, I ended up not only using those because there were many more that hadn't been transcribed and some of the ones that I really wanted to read were only in the original. So I ended up going back into some of the original diaries as well. You, you, the diaries that we read, the, the, the excerpts that from the diaries that we read here are from five different people, very, very diverse, um, a, a very diverse group of five people. How did you choose those, those particular people? So there were, um, there, there are five main ones, and then I use a, a number of smaller ones as well, but I wanted to, um, like I said, sort of use the diary collection in the way that it was intended to be used in the sense of this broad perspective on the war from lots of different viewpoints. So um, I wanted to have um, NS Bayers, which were the Dutch Nazis, 
and I wanted to have some Jewish perspectives and I wanted to have some resistors perspectives and also people who were politically unaffiliated. So um, I had um, the help of some of the archivists, obviously, who work there. Um, they had done a beautiful job of sort of um, organizing and summarizing the collection. So there were um, 2,100 diaries in the collection. And when they came in about the first 1,000 of them were summarized and um, critiqued by the people who worked in the archive. So I could go through those and sort of figure out which ones I wanted, uh, which sounded interesting to me. And, um, and then of course I had conversations with the archivists about like which, which were the best written ones, which were the most interesting, compelling, and so on. So they gave me some recommendations. And then in the summary file, they also had like post-it notes, like put on the ones that were the most interesting. So that helped, that helped me narrow it down. Um, and what I was really looking for were diaries that were very descriptive, that gave a very vivid sense of the world that person inhabited. But I also wanted to choose diaries that were emblematic of a particular kind of experience. So for, for example, I chose a police officer who was an NSB or a Nazi. And he, um, he, he, he started his diary before the occupation of the Netherlands and he stopped kind of um, before the war was over. We don't really know why, but he had written 3,300 pages of diaries, um, 18 volumes. It's a stack like this big. And um, and I was really interested in his perspective because the, the Dutch police had been so instrumental in the persecution of the Jews in the Netherlands. They had been um, very much involved in all the roundups, all the implementation of all the regulations by the Nazis. They were you know, attacking resistors and they were very complicit. So I was very interested in why someone would do that. So that was one part, for example. And then um, on the Jewish side, I had um, one diary writer who was uh, in hiding, one diary writer who was in a concentration camp and one diary writer who was part of the Jewish council. And the Jewish Council of Amsterdam is a very controversial institution. A lot of people blamed the council for its role in also conveying the information that the Nazis wanted them to convey and, and basically aiding somewhat in the deportations without knowing what was really happening. And so there's a wonderful woman who was at the time 21 years old and she was a secretary at the Jewish Council. And um, she was writing letters to her husband, her fiance, sorry, who was on his way, who had already left for Palestine. And so she wrote these letters to him all the time and they turned into a kind of diary because she wasn't allowed to send them. And she has an extraordinary story. She's still alive. She's 105 years old. And I got to meet her in Israel last year. So um, her story gave me a way of looking at that whole part of the narrative of what happened in the Netherlands. And so each one sort of illuminated a different aspect of the war period. One of the things that I was so struck by, and I'm just amazed that I didn't know this, is that 75% of Dutch Jews were killed um, or exterminated um, during that period. Which is higher, a much higher percentage than many of the Eastern European countries that we typically focus on. Um, why, why was that so, why was that percentage so high? I can't answer that in one sentence, but it is a central question of the book. So I try to look at different um, um, aspects of the answer. And I try to do that through different ways of looking at the question. So um, you're right that in, in Western Europe, it is the highest percentage of any population. Um, in France, the percentage was 25% of the Jewish population was uh, deported and exterminated. And then in Belgium, which is just next door, it was um, about 40%. So the numbers are significantly different. Um, I think, um, of course, uh, there are many factors that played into it. 
One of them is um, clearly proximity to Germany. It was very hard for people to um, get out. It was You couldn't really cross the English Channel by boat and very easily because it was constantly under bombardment. And also the borders were all closed, obviously. If you needed, if you tried to escape, you had to go through Belgium and France. Um, so you had to cross two more occupied borders before you got anywhere. So it was basically, you were um, caught in a natural trap is what someone wrote. Um, and I, but so that's one aspect that's, but I also think there's a, there's a, a much larger and more important question about complicity and why the Dutch cooperated to the extent that they did. Um, I'm not saying that the whole country collaborated, but there were, but the many aspects of the society collaborated. So the police collaborated, the train, um, the national railways collaborated, the um, the civil administration mostly went along to get along. The um, the businesses, the industry participated in the German war machine. So you can say, well, I mean, there's there's ways of talking about that as a, like how much national guilt should be carried at this point. And I think there's a lot in the Netherlands where you know I live here, so I'm aware of like all these discussions about um, were we indifferent or were we unable to do anything? Was it too much? Was there a great deal of terror? You know, all these things are factors. And I think um, ultimately, ultimately, we don't, we haven't, and they, the, the country hasn't quite acknowledged um, the extent to which um, it really um, participated in the Nazi machine. And that's one of the things I really wanted to point out in this book and, and look at in a, in a deep way, but also through the eyes of the people who lived here, not just imposing a story of my own. Right. Um, so, so that was one of the things, uh, that huge percentage of deaths. But another thing that I was so interested in that, that you talk about is the silence, the, the, the almost... Um, almost sort of deliberate amnesia after the war um, and the and the <clears throat> the inability to come to terms with what happened to even talk about it in any way talk about that you know how, how did that how did that strike you what 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 did you what what was your response to that or how did you understand yeah. it I was having a coffee with a German friend of mine this morning and she was saying to me, you know, in Germany, we just had to talk about this all the time. It was just constant education and constant uh, rec like issues of reconciliation. Just it was so much part of the curriculum. And I don't think in the Netherlands is the same thing. This country, although it's um, in many ways, you know, was was part of the machinery just has not articulated its own role, has not looked at its own past, has not been curious about what happened in the same way. I mean, there are definitely historians who are, and there's a certain part of this population who does, but I think in general, um, there was, in the immediate post-war period, there was a silence for about at least, um, at least a decade, um, at least two decades, actually, until 1965, when the first book about the destruction of the Dutch Jews was published by Jacques Presser, and that was sort of a seismic shift in the population, in the in the public perception of the war. And I spend the last chapters of the book talking about how that shifted over the next several decades. But um, for a long time, there was this construction of this idea that the Dutch have mostly been you know, valiantly um, resistant to the Nazi ideology, that nobody wanted the Germans here, that most people were resistors, that there were only a few people who were you know, part of the collaboration effort. And um, and that has, that has eroded over time. Different generations have had different messages. For a while, people were very focused on... Um, what did we do wrong? And then there was like a shift back. And then there's been many sort of waves of discussion about how resistant was this country and why um, why was it not? Or, and right now we're in this moment of 
a lot of controversy about it. And it, it took until 2021 for there to be one memorial that said all the names of the 102,200 <laughs> uh, Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust in the Netherlands, not in the Netherlands, but from the Netherlands. And um, now we are this year, later this year, finally we'll have a, a national Holocaust museum in this country. And as you know, many other countries have already had a kind of reckoning with this past to some extent. There are other institutions and memorials. And um, I think it, it just, it, it's been a hard struggle for national identity that's been going on. And I, I try to sort of trace that in, in my history. Um, so I want to talk about the the memorial, the recent memorial. But but before that, before we get to that, there was a memorial um, that 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 the Queen, um, the Dutch Queen, had uh, had feelings about. Um, talk about that. It's called the Gratitude Monument. It was in the. Um so after the war, the Jewish community, especially in Amsterdam, was just devastated. I mean, most people who came home waited and waited and waited, and none of their relatives returned. Their, you know, 75% died. So most people lost everybody and lost, um, you know, their whole broad clan. And um, the people who came back were also facing a lot of anti-Semitism. This has been well documented documented by other historians that um, anti-Semitism actually rose after the war in Holland. And um, people would come back and they would be told um, that they had to pay back taxes on their property with the, which they were unable to pay, obviously, because they were in concentration camp. So, um, I think there was a great deal of sadness and grief and so on. But the, um, the, the, the general society wanted to move on and feel better and forget about this whole thing and basically say, you know, we were good to the Jews, we did the best we could to support them, and couldn't they just, you know, say that we did enough, essentially. So, so there's a lot of um, debate about how this monument came to, into being, but there was the first monument, and for a long time, the only monument that commemorated the Jewish experience of the Holocaust in the Netherlands was a gratitude monument. It was a monument that basically thanked the non-Jewish population for all they had done to support the Jews during the war. And just to give you a sense of like how... Um, how some people felt about it. There wasn't any member of the Jewish community that came to the opening ceremony for that monument. Um, and uh, it, it left a bitter taste in the mouth of a lot of people for a very long time. And then after that, there was not, um, a, there, was a, there was a location that was used as a monument, which was the former theater from which many, many people were deported. And um, that's called the Hollands Kalberg, which was a state theater, and then it became a Jewish theater, and then it was a deportation center. Um, and then there they had a monument that listed names, but it only listed last names. So for everybody named Cohen, it was one name. And so <laughs> what's beautiful about the new monument, at least from my perspective, is that you see every single Cohen, and it's like row after row after row after row, and and it's just a very powerful and sad and uh, moving to see that. Yeah, I when when you you describe visiting it with some friends and and go, your friend going into it with a list of names that she wanted to find, and I, I was reminded of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. Um, the to the I think it's something to the murdered Jews of Europe, which I also found extremely moving. Um, hard to see how you could not find that moving, but that made me want to want to see those names that seem to go on forever. You know, that's a lot of names, and it personalizes them that it isn't just a last name; that it's everyone in the family. Um, 
this must have been a very, very emotional experience for you writing this book. It was. My my grandfather was a, a Mauthausen survivor. Uh, my mother was a child in hiding, and my grandmother was a child um, in hiding with her. Uh, this was in Hungary, so I don't have Dutch family connections, but of course I know a lot of Dutch people who do. And um, so for me, it was a little bit of a um, personal journey to try and understand what it was like for people, um, for um, for what it meant to live through it or not or not live through it or to um, experience all of that on a day to day basis. And it was, it was, um, I mean, I did it during the lockdown. Um, sometimes I, I went, as I describe in the book, to visit places where people were either in hiding or where people were uh, imprisoned. Um, and I've been to many of the locations in this book. I mean, I used to live around the corner for many of the locations in the book. And um, it was, it was, um, I had some horrible dreams. <laughs> I had some deep, dark moments, and um, I'm glad that I, it was a kind of uh, terrifying and hard, um, but I feel like it was a very useful and powerful experience for me. I mean, when I, I translated the diaries myself, and when I started, um, my Dutch is mediocre. I mean, I... My Dutch is much better now, but when I started, <laughs> I had to like look up every other word in every sentence. And when you do that, you slow down to this very, very, um, you know, intense pace where, and you get very intimate with the words. And so when you're reading about someone's life in a, in a transit camp where every day they're waiting to find out if their name is on the list to be deported, they, um, and you're inside, you're inside every sentence, you know, so it feels very, very intense. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I, it's over now. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have one more question for you, which is, what do you want the readers of this book to take away from it? I, I want people to, um, there's a couple of things. I want people to see it as a resource, as a tool. I want people to tell more stories because we've come to rely so much on Anne Frank's diary, which is a beautiful book, but is limited in its scope and its vision. I mean, she was trapped in a hiding place and couldn't, she didn't know what was happening. And other diaries do tell us more parts of that story. They give us a broader landscape. And I think I want people to use it in that way to to see what people had to say. Philip Mechanicus, for example, writes so beautifully from an adult perspective about what's happening in the persecution of the Jews in the Netherlands. And it's, we really need to read this. And it's not that there aren't, um, obviously there are many, many books about the Holocaust and there are many, many writings, but what I feel I, I want people to take away from this is the immediacy of the way diaries are written, that they're moment by moment that, um, we live as moral creatures in an environment where we can't know what's going to happen. We make choices based on what we can guess. And it's so easy for us now to look back on history and say, I, I would have done this or they should have done that. But when you're, you know, you have a limited scope, it's like living day to day. I think that it's, we really, I would like people to start thinking about how the war unfolded. Because when you start to look at it that way, then you look at your own choices now, day to day. Right. Um, and you think, what choice am I making? What resistance am I showing? Like, what, how much could I stand up to what's happening right. today? Because all these things are so relevant. I mean, you know, I don't think this is, I hope it's not a book about history. I hope it's a book about how we choose where mm -hmm. we stand right. in our own lives. Um, there's a novel that I read uh, several years ago that was set in Holland during this period by by a writer named Harry Mulish, and it's called The Assault. Mm 
and I, I had forgotten all about that book until I read Diary Keepers, and then it brought it all back. And, yeah. and my experience just reading the book, which is so wonderful, such an experience of um, terror and sadness and horror and all of that, um, I think those are, in a way, good feelings to have because it shows that we still have the capacity to be appalled by events. Um, and, and your book made me feel that same, that same thankfulness that, that we can still respond that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. I guess the Harry Willis is a, a very famous Dutch national writer. He's written a lot about the war period. And um, I think his work, yeah, it does also have that kind of immediacy. Yeah. Yeah, right. And and I, I I just thought it was very, you're talking about what a diary is, that it isn't, that we look at it as a piece of history, but we forget that it was written as it was happening, you know, moment by moment by moment. I, I think, I, I don't know, made me want to go back and start keeping a diary again, which I hadn't done since I was like 16 or 17. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote this, um, so this book came out of a, an article that I wrote for the New York Times that appeared, well, I had started working on it in 2019, and um, my editor became more and more interested in it, and he kept asking me to send more materials, so we were excerpting parts of the collection, and what ended up happening was that the lockdown came in March 2020, and um my editor said to me, you know, a lot of other stories that we were working on are less relevant now, but yours is more relevant because <laughs> <laughs> people are in a new, people are thinking about like, what does it mean to be forced to grapple with a situation that's so alien to their own experience? And then what I was thinking at that time was like, I hope this I mean, I wanted to write a thing at the bottom of it, like keep a diary of the okay. Corona period because it's so like the world changes and people want to have a record of that. But of course people did, people instinctively do. And people do, um, people do in every war period as it happens. And I recently wrote a piece about people keeping diaries in Ukraine. Like it's just, it's a natural response. Diaries are, um, it's also interesting because we think of diaries as adolescent um, girl writings, right? And when you, you can think of it as like, but then there's this other form of diary writing, which is wartime diaries where people are writing down. So actually, but they're the same in a sense, because they're both um, a record of a subversion. It's a record of keeping track of things that nobody is allowed to talk about. And so like, you're not allowed to talk about your your politics and wartime, you're not allowed to talk about your menstrual period, you know, in public. So, so it's like what you keep it in this intimate way. It's a reportage of, of, a, of a personal experience that's um, subversive, right, in one way or another. Yes, yes. Nina, thank you so much for being on the show. I mean, the time just flew. I feel like we could keep talking. Um, but um, thank you. Thank you for the Diary Keepers, uh, your new book. And um, have a good evening over have there. Evening. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And let's talk more on the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night. Bye.